Section 34 of The Golden Web by E. Phillips Oppenheim. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Two, Chapter Thirteen, Desperation. The curtain had fallen upon the first act of this little drama in Dean's life. Hefferon was committed for trial. Dean had walked into the court a few minutes late, as though the whole affair was one which interested him only indirectly. He had gone into the witness box without hesitation, and his story had been so perfectly rational and straightforward that people began to wonder whether, indeed, any defense was possible. Cross-examination only amused him. Hefferon, who went into court expecting to be released, was committed at once to the old Bailey, and, to everyone's surprise, his own included, was refused bail. Dean left the court a few minutes after the case was closed, and paused for a moment to light a cigarette on the steps. On the edge of the pavement there was a woman who watched with steady and scrutinizing interest every person who left the entrance of the law courts. When Dean came out she advanced towards him. "'Is Hefferman free?' she asked. Dean looked at her and recognized at once Ruby Sinclair. No, he answered. He is committed for trial. You? She leaned forward as though about to strike him. Dean neither shrank back nor showed any sign of interest in her words. What is Hefferman to you? he asked quickly. He is no blackmailer at any rate, she answered fiercely. The court has ventured to think otherwise, Dean declared. She was almost at his side now. Suddenly his eyes caught the sight of something glittering something half drawn from the pocket of her dress. Her wrist was caught in a clasp of iron. Young lady, he said sternly, are you mad? If I am, it is your fault, she answered. Nonsense, he declared. You see that policeman there? He is watching us now. Let go the revolver and be off. I don't want to give you into custody. My life is worth something for others as well as myself, and I shall certainly do it unless you obey me. She gave a little sob, and her fingers relaxed their hold upon the revolver, which Dean transferred into his own pocket. She glided away into the crowd. Dean stepped into his brougham, giving the man the address of the hotel where Winifred Rowan was staying. He leaned back in the seat, looking at the little weapon in his hands. Somehow, the fact of his escape, instead of bringing any exultation with it, seemed to depress him strangely. Dean had never called himself or believed himself to be a religious man, yet there was certainly one principle which had always been part of his creed, to live and let live. He was not a greedy capitalist. He could look upon money without any desire to absorb it. Yet lately he seemed to have been forced into torturous paths. From the moment when he had attempted to make use of Rowan as a tool, everything had gone against him. Rowan himself lay dead in that windy churchyard, and the words which had been spoken over Rowan's grave were still fresh in his memory. He had lost Lady Olive, of whom, in a way, he had been fond, and at her own bidding he was engaged to this strange, impenetrable girl, a situation which he could not wholly realize, and yet which he felt to be surrounded with danger and humiliation. Then there was this other, Ruby Sinclair, who had come to London expecting to find a fortune, and had found nothing but her uncle's dead body. She, too, looked upon him as a hungry schemer, the indirect cause of her uncle's death, a robber, if not a murderer. He looked at the little revolver, opened it carelessly, and laughed as he stared into the empty breech. It was unloaded, a brand-new toy which had never been discharged. He threw it into the opposite seat with a little gesture of contempt. All its tragedy seemed to have passed away. She had bought it to frighten him with. There had, after all, been no serious purpose in her mind. She, too, perhaps, had hoped to play the part of extortioner. What was his offense, he asked himself, as his brougham guided along the embankment? Simply this. There had been a claim presented for his mine, which was without a doubt a fraud, which few people would ever have believed in, and which, in a court of law, would have stood but little chance of success. What a fool he had been not to defy Sinclair, 
to go to his directors and tell them the truth, to resist stoutly any claim that man might bring. Since his first compromise with Rowan, everything had gone wrong. It was unworthy for a man in his position to have allowed Rowan even to play the ambassador, apart from anything else. He saw very clearly in those few minutes where the mistake of his life had been. What he could not see was whither he was tending. Winifred was waiting for him in the hall of the small hotel in Dover Street. For three days, at her own request, he had not seen her. Nothing, however, had prepared him for the transformation which he now saw. She was faultlessly dressed in a gown of the latest design, and a picture hat, which even he recognized as being something quite apart from the usual efforts of even the Bond Street shopkeepers. In every detail she seemed to express the wholly self-satisfied, half-insolent perfection of the woman who knows that she may and does command the best of everything. And with this change in her dress seemed to have come a similar change in her deportment. Her aloofness was still evident enough, but she carried herself with confidence and with a sort of languid, graceful ease. "'You are nearly ten minutes late,' she said quietly. "'Where are you taking me to lunch?' "'Wherever you like,' he answered. "'What about princes?' She took a gold purse and a tiny black spaniel from the neatly dressed maid who stood by her side and, lifting her skirts in her other hand, passed through the door which he was holding open. The lace of her petticoat, the slenderness of her arched instep, the delicate narrowness of her patent shoes were revelations to him. He gave an order to his chauffeur and sat down by her side. "'You appear,' he said, "'to possess a gift for assimilation.' "'My sex is like that,' she said. "'I have had a good many years to wait, to store up knowledge in. Besides,' she continued, a little mockingly, "'you yourself are supposed to be something exceptional in the way of grooming, aren't you?' There is no need for other people to find our engagement surprising. Looking at her critically, I think, he said, that there is no fear of that. You flatter me, she murmured. Not at all, he answered. People might wonder, perhaps, how it is possible to fall in love with anyone whose expression so much resembles that of those statues in there, pointing to a gallery which they were passing. You have no other fault. There is none, at least, to be found in your appearance. You certainly do look, however, a little inclined to be faultily faultless. She laughed, a laugh, however, which brought no color into her cheeks or light into her eyes. I am a statue, she said, into which life has not yet been breathed. You see, you have been a little remiss up till now. You have never attempted to make love to me. Do you mean to say, he asked, leaning towards her? She gently pushed back his hand, saying, Please don't be ridiculous. Of course you must know that overtures of that sort, under the circumstances, are impossible. For always, he asked. Certainly. Perhaps you will draw up a little code of conditions, he remarked. I feel a little in the dark sometimes as to what is expected of me. You will easily pick it up as we go along, she replied. Is this Prince's? I wonder if I shall succeed in behaving as though I had lunched here every day of my life. End of section 34